Yeah, so uh, I'm Jay Kroll. I'm a student here at the University of Colorado in the Vita Group. I'm actually just across the way from here. Um, but I'm going to move into the solar system and talk more about Earth and Venus and um, about some photochemical formation of aerosols, why we care about those, and um, some work that I've been doing on sulfur chemistry with sulfur dioxide. And so um, just to give you some background about why we care about sulfur, um, sulfur has been observed in a number of planetary bodies, um, including um, a number of the rocky planets, as well as um, some moons, Jovian moons. Um, and I'll be focusing on Venus and Earth and kind of the implications there. Um, and so sulfur is really important for climate and uh, for understanding the temperature of our planet, the energy budget. Um, the reason for this is in any sort of oxidizing atmosphere, most of the sulfur that gets released ends up as sulfur dioxide. Um, then through reactions with OH radicals goes on to form this HSO3. Um, ultimately, you end up with this SO3, and through a water catalyzed reaction, you get sulfur sulfuric acid. Um, and so sulfuric acid is really important because it's this hygroscopic molecule. It likes to take up water and form aerosol, which is this, um, in this case, an aqueous droplet suspended in the air. Um, so in Earth's atmosphere, in the lower atmosphere, in the troposphere, where there's a lot of water, um, what ends up happening is you seed cloud and you get rain out, um, and that sulf and so then most of it's depleted. Um, however, in the upper atmosphere where there's a lot less water, that SO2 tends to stick around. You get much higher concentrations of SO2, um, and that aerosol, rather than raining out, um, stays suspended for a number of years. Um, and thus, um, this is really important because it can reflect away a lot of uh, incoming solar radiation and change the temperature of the planet. Um, and so in Earth, we actually end up with this Jungle layer, uh, which is a layer of aerosol that you can see at about 15 to 20 kilometers in the atmosphere. Um, and you can see that it actually uh, reflects away quite a large amount of light. Um, and any time that there's a large eruption on Earth that injects large amounts of SO2 into the stratosphere, um, we see these large changes in optical depth, where an increase in optical depth means that there's more light being scattered away. And these sorts of events can have you know, fractions of a de uh, degree Celsius change on the planet uh, overall temperature. Um, but so if we go to Venus, Venus tells us something pretty interesting. Um, because there's huge amounts of sulfur in Venus's atmosphere, um, about from 50 to 70 kilometers, there's this large sulfuric acid clouds um, that cover the entire planet. Um, but interestingly, starting at about 90 kilometers, there's a huge increase in SO2 and sulfur monoxide concentration, several orders of magnitude change. Um, and this actually exceeds any model predictions by uh, multiple orders of magnitude. And so what this tells us, there's probably some sort of chemical formation of SO2 in the middle atmosphere of Venus. Um, but what's really interesting about this is that these conditions are very similar to Earth's stratosphere and mesosphere. And when I'm talking about these conditions, I mean temperature, water content, um, and incoming solar flux. Um, and so one of the things that the models have done to try and account for this is to implement this infrared visible photolysis of sulfuric acid that was some work done in our group a number of years ago. Um, and so in the case here, what happens, um, what's interesting is this, this photolysis on the ground electronic state. You're exciting a vibration, this OH stretch, um, to the V equal 4, V equals 5 level. And when that happens, that hydrogen starts to hop across the molecule and can jump from one oxygen to another. And in the case where it jumps to the oxygen that already has an OH, you get photolysis and leading to SO3 and water. And when you're at the high altitude um, in the atmosphere where there's a lot of UV light available, that SO3 then immediately photolyzes to form SO2. So this is a photochemical uh, source of SO2 in the atmosphere. Um, however, this doesn't even begin to account for the amount of SO2 that's uh, observed in Venus's atmosphere. And so the models do a couple of other things to then try and compensate and account for this. 
um, that may or may not be physically accurate. Um, one of which is they include an inaccurate UV cross-section. So they take the upper limits of measured cross-sections from about 200 to 320 nanometers um, and assume that all the light absorbed immediately leads to photolysis, um, although a lot of work that's been done um, has shown that this cross-section actually is probably much smaller and is not actually leading to any sort of UV photolysis. Um, another thing that they do is they include red light photolysis of the sulfuric acid mo uh, monohydrate, where the sulfuric acid molecule is complexed with a water molecule. Um, this does lower the barrier for this reaction. Um, however, there is one problem with that, and that a lot of work that's been done looking at this has shown that instead of leading to photolysis, instead what happens is the energy goes into breaking these hydrogen bonds and leads to dissociation of the cluster rather than photolysis of the sulfuric acid. So neither of these things are likely to be actually happening in the atmosphere. Um, so this has led to us to ask the question of, if we look at the entire um, system of SO2, um, is there something else? Is there another reservoir, or some other molecule that could be uh, photolyzing and leading to SO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and so one thing that we're started to look at is sulfurous acid, H2SO3, rather than H2SO4. Um, and this is an interesting molecule. Um, it's tricky for a number of reasons. It's never actually been observed in the gas phase. Um, and a couple reasons for this is that H2SO3 is energetically uphill. So SO2 plus water um, is energetically much more favorable to go down. Um, as well as you pay an entropic uh, price for making H2SO3, as well as you go from two molecules to one. Um, and there's this large barrier to forming it. So you need to get over the barrier um, and form it. And as you add more and more water, you drop this barrier. However, when you drop that barrier, it's much more likely for it to then fall apart and make SO2 instead. Um, and so we've been looking for other ways to try and make this molecule, and uh, we've done some theoretical work with Jamie Donaldson. Um, and so um, you'll note I've kind of swapped directions here from SO2 plus water to making the acid. It's about 5 kcal per mole uphill. You have this large barrier, um, about 35 kcal per mole. Um, however, there is this excited electronic state for SO2. So it's this triplet state that you can excite to. Um, when you're there in a collision with water, a relatively mild collision, you can create this uh, complex that then inner system crosses back to an excited singlet state, um, which are just two different types of electronic states. And then that singlet state can then proceed forward to make sulfurous acid. Um, and so this is a potentially new pathway to try and make this. Um, and so one thing I'd like to note is this triplet state is actually a forbidden transition. You'll note that this is a spectrum multiplied by 500. Um, so it's actually forbidden to go from the ground electronic state to that triplet state. Um, however, there is this large singlet state absorption in SO2 from about 250 to 310 nanometers. Um, and there's been a, num a lot of work done showing that you can excite this state and then that rapidly inner system crosses to the triplet state. Um, which can then go on to do reactions. And so in my experiments, uh, we excite with a xenon arc lamp that's uh, filtered. So this filter shows that we cut off at about 295 nanometers. Um, the reason why we do that is because we're trying to avoid exciting this state over here. Um, this is a uh, photoactive state where SO2 photolyzes to form sulfur monoxide and um, excited oxygen atoms. So we really wanted to avoid in initiating any sort of chemistry with that. Um, so in our system, we use this filtered xenon light, and then um, in, at a right angle to that, we have a green laser uh, going through the system um, that we then detect, and any time you form any sort of aerosol, that laser beam then gets scattered, and you can measure a depletion in the laser intensity and show that you're actually making aerosol. Um, and so here, uh, you can actually see pictures of our experiment. You can see that we have this green laser light uh, going through. Um, this is with the lamp on. When you have the lamp off, you actually can't even see this laser beam. So you can see that there's a large amount of scattering of light. And so then to give you something that's a little more quantitative, um, if we have just water in the cell, we turn on the lamp at time zero. Um, you get no depletion. Um, same thing if you have just SO2. 
as soon as you have any sort of mixture, you get a depletion. And as we increase the ratio of SO2 to water, we get a larger depletion. Um, so we are forming aerosol uh, through some sort of acid formation. Um, so one question we wanted to really make sure of is this OH chemistry, this traditional OH chemistry in our atmosphere. We wanted to make sure that wasn't happening. So a common thing in atmospheric experiments is to use cyclohexane as an OH scavenger to react with all of the OH that's potentially there um, and remove it from the system. There's just one problem with this. It turns out the SO2, if you have cyclohexane, as soon as you excite and you end up in that triplet state, it rapidly reacts with cyclohexane to form aerosol even faster than you do with water. Um, so it fills the cell with this iridescent cloud and there's not a lot that we can do about that. Um, we did do experiments with cyclohexane and just water to make sure that there was no aerosol formation, and we don't see any aerosol formation there. Um, so we're relatively sure that there's no OH chemistry going on. However, we can't include this with the SO2 in the system. Um, and so instead, I turned to a kinetics box model, so a relatively simple kinetics box model. Um, but one thing to point out is that it is possible through SO2, SO2 collisions that we can make SO3 that would go on to form um, sulfuric acid. Um, and so we look at this SO3 collisions um, using the side bottom at all uh, uh, collisional deactivation of this triplet state. We assume that some fraction, this branching ratio, leads to a formation of acid. Um, and so if we assume that the branching ratio is 100%, we can see that this blue line is sulfurous acid. Um, in either case, far outcompetes the formation of sulfuric acid. Um, and in the lower concentration SO2, where you do, uh, decrease those SO2, SO2 interactions, we actually lead to an even larger increase. And so if we instead look at the ratio of sulfurous to sulfuric acid formation, um, you'll note that you do not need to have a branching ratio of 100%. Um, if we go to these much lower concentrations of SO2, where I've now done some more experiments of that, um, you can even have a branching ratio of 1 or 2% and still outcompete that formation of sulfuric acid. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my group and our sources of funding, and thank you guys for your time, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Can you resolve differences in stable isotopes of uh, sulfur species spectroscopically? Um, so with our system, we cannot. Um, I don't have the ability to look at different isotopes. Um, however, I'm definitely interested in um, doing some mass spec experiments um, where, um, depending on the mass spectrometer, we might be able to actually look at that. This is definitely that triplet state, um, that interconversion from the singlet to triplet state um, does depend on the mass of the sulfur isotopes, and so it will lead to a sulfur mass independent fraction. Not for the experimental work, but for the, I guess, the observations that you're doing? Um, so the observations were done with Venus Express. Um, I know they definitely can't, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Other questions? All right, if not, then let's thank the uh, speakers for this session.